Hey everybody, today Rotto runs through the top 10 fantasy games, woohoo! Never let it be said I waste any money on production value. It's all about the quality of the content, not the presentation here at Rotto Runs Through. Yes, hi everybody. I am starting to do a series of top 10 videos because people have been requesting it for me for quite a while. There's a thread devoted to it, stuff like that, so I am finally bending to the will of my viewers and I'm starting to do top 10s. And I figured fantasy would be a good one to start with because all reasonable card carrying geeks love fantasy, don't they? Of course they do. So let's get right to it. Although actually, I should say a couple of things. First of all, when I'm talking about fantasy here, I am talking about bread and butter, swords and sorcery, Gary Gygax, J.R.R. Tolkien, goblins and trolls and dragons fantasy. I mean, I know fantasy is a pretty broad term and that could include I don't know, like dreamscapes, like uh, Onurim or Dixit or something like that. But nope, this is just straight up um, go into a dungeon and slay dragons and collect loot and level up type stuff. If it's not in a fantasy setting, it's not on the list. Oh, one other thing I should say, speaking of what's not on the list. This is a very subjective list of Jens and my favorite fantasy themed games. Not the best games. Bear in mind, I mean, we actually own some games that I think objectively are superior games. You know, better in terms of gameplay or structure or, or innovation or whatever. Um, but these are the 10 that we enjoy the most, that we absolutely love playing. So with that out of the way, let's get going. And we will start with number 10, which is a very heavy box. Runebound, okay. Actually, I just did a run through on Runebound the other day. And uh, so you can watch that if you'd like. This is an excellent, excellent, you know, when I'm talking about meat and potatoes fantasy, that's what this gives. And it, actually, I think in our entire collection, we do not have a game that comes closer to straight up Ameritrash than Runebound. But Runebound does distinguish itself through one very specific mechanism. I mean, you, you run around the world and you fight monsters and you level up and you get treasure and you eventually destroy the big powerful uh, monster that's going to destroy the world, etc. And you know, there's expansions, there's tons of expansions. Uh, you know, so it does all that stuff really, really well. And you roll dice and try to roll higher than the defense of your eye, all that stuff. What really makes this game is the travel dice. These five dice that at the beginning of every turn you roll these and they have a bunch of symbols on them that represent different terrain. This, uh, if this side came up, this means I can spend this die to travel on a road, plains, or hills. Whereas if I'd rolled this, it means I could travel on a river or in a swamp. And so every turn, the first thing you do is you roll these dice and then you have to figure out where can you actually go? Where can you travel in the world? Because you might have desperately been hoping this turn to make it to the frigid town up north because they have an awesome sword for sale there that you've been saving up and you want to buy it. But then you roll and you get no mountains. And you know, I guess that means you know, thematically all the mountain passes are closed down and so you can't get through the mountains. Now, but you do have a couple of roads. So if you go east, you know, around the mountain, east, around the mountains, you might be able to get to the road and then almost make it and so on. You know, the fact that every turn turns into a puzzle that you have to solve to try and get where you need to go is what really makes Runebound special. It's what we absolutely love about it and what, you know, separates it from the many, many, many bog standard fantasy adventure games that are on the market. It's why we love it. It's why we're always going to keep it. It's why this box is so heavy. I've got about half the expansions and I hope someday to complete the uh, collection, but we'll see. Anyway, so that's number 10, Runebound. Alrighty, moving on to number nine. Oh, this is exciting. What could it be? Draco or Draco. Um, I think Draco from Adam Kaluza, who is a fantastic designer from the game for the game. Um, what do you call it? Uh, K2 and also the cave, you know, and so his other two games are these very more serious real world extreme survival games that are both great, really fantastic. In fact, I've done a run through for Cave. Should do a run through for K2 and for Draco someday too. Draco, he really kind of played against type um, and you know created this very, very neat fantasy game. It's a very simple, small game. It is all about the struggle between life and death on this very tiny board, this very small little board of hexes in this little tiny canyon where a wounded dragon 
is being hunted by three dwarves who are there to take him out. And every turn, uh, the dragons and the dwarves have a set of cards. And these cards are very, very simple. They let you move, they let you, you know, attack in different kinds of ways. And but you have a very small hand of cards, and so you have to be very, very careful about how you spend those cards. And it's a two-player game. One player controls the dragon, who is incredibly powerful but is wounded. And the other player controls the three separate dwarves, these very, very cool minis. The guy with the crossbow, the guy with the axe and shield, and um, you know, the guy with the net. And each one of them has special powers they can use to you know, mess with the dragon. And the dragon, of course, has, has um, fire and claws and wings and all that stuff. And the interesting thing is, as the dwarves uh, you know, get successful hits against the dragon, they can direct the hits to his feet, so his mobility is limited, to, you know, to his mouth, so you know, his flames are... And, and so over time, they slowly wear him down. But never go against a cornered dragon, because he can fight back to the very, very end. And, you know, the same thing happens with the dwarves. You know, they could lose their shields when the dragon hits them, or, you know, and so on. So, it's a fantastic game. Very tense, very exciting. It's really a very simple hand management card game, but so thematic. And it plays really quick, too. Generally, when Jen and I play it, um, we will basically play it twice. Me being the dragon once, and Jen being the dragon once. Great game. Absolutely love it. Draco, number nine. Okay, moving on to number eight, which is a silly, lovely, funny game, Troll Holla, which of course is, you know, a variant of uh, Valhalla, which of course is the is heaven for Vikings, where they go when they die gloriously on the battlefield. And this is a game all about Viking trolls who sail the seven seas, looting and plunder. Now, I guess you could argue this is kind of uh, just on the hairy edge of fantasy, because it really is, this is more of a pirate, or not a pirate, a, a Viking, a Viking piratey type game. But it doesn't change the fact that you're controlling trolls, and it's a fantasy universe, and it's just adorable. The game itself has such a wonderful sense of humor, the art is incredibly is sweet and touching, and um, you know, you, you take your, 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 your troll tokens, you got them in your color, and you put them on these boats, and they sail around. To, uh, from island to island, and um, when, when enough troll, when a boat gets to an island, when a, when a boat makes it over to an island, all the trolls rush off the boat and capture whatever villagers and livestock and whatever there might have been there, and you know, you know, basically, you're running around plundering. And in addition to that, there's weather spots on the map that you can, you know, they, or, they, or uh, they, you know, can get you weather cards that you can use to change and suddenly, you know, twist everything around and surprise your opponent. And it's it, it's hard. It's a really simple set collection game, but it's a lot of fun. It's got some surprising depth. You could actually play this with anybody. This is a really good gateway game. But there's some things you can do to make it a little bit more complex, which is the way Jen and I like it. Very very enjoyable. Very fun game. Number eight, or number, no, is that number seven? Yeah, number seven. Wow, we're going, no, no, number eight, Trollhalla. Now, now for number seven. Sorry guys, this is uh, my first top ten. I'm a little bit shaky, but anyway, number seven, Shadow Rift. Now this is an awesome game. I believe, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first ever cooperative deck builder. And now the Squadron Deck Goes are starting to come out, you know, uh, Fast and Furious, Dime a Dozen, but this was the first one. And so far, the ones we played, this is still the best. In this game, players are working together cooperatively by building a deck that represents their hero and all the cool moves their hero has, the you know, spells they can cast, the tactical moves they can use in combat, and um, are trying to fight off wave after wave of bad guy who are coming to wipe out this wonderful village. And now the village, it's actually weird, it's, you know, it's, it's a deck builder, and it's just cooperative. And you know, so the cards you get, you know, make you allow you to work in cooperative ways. That's one of the things that's really nice about this. The the deck, the cards themselves you can draft into your deck are truly cooperative. You know, they are truly designed so that okay, this will work for me in this turn if you do this on on at the same time. But the other cool thing about this game is the village itself is populated with villagers that if you rescue them, they can go into your deck as well and they can give you special abilities. And by the same token, some of the monsters can actually, you know, do they, they can like do stuff like burn you, which puts burn cards in your deck and kind of slows you down until you hear yourself. So there's a lot of really cool, clever mechanisms. I've done a run through this a while ago. Great, great game. Highly recommend it. Shadow Rift. So that was 10, 9, 8, 7. Number 6. Ah, uh, and this might be... No, I was going to say, this is actually the second heaviest game on the list. The Gnomes of Zavendor. 
And now some people might say this is also kind of pushing it. Is this really fancy? Well, you know what? It's got gnomes in it. It's all about gnomes, and so it's fantasy in our book. It's basically a game where gnomes are working in a gem mine, uh, you know, collecting gems. And I mean, I can just see from the back, I'm not gonna pull the whole thing out because it comes—it's very modular. It comes in a lot of different pieces. And so there's all these cards that might be different gems, and you go around and you try to dig them up, and you basically collect gems. While at the same time, there is a commodities market where the different types of gems go up and down in terms of value. And so you're basically focusing on two things: you know, this collection of resources, and then buying and buying buying low and selling high on the commodities market. It's a very, very cool game, very smart, very clever, um, and you can get it super cheap. It seems like it didn't really catch the world on fire, but Jen and I were very pleasantly surprised when we finally got this to the table. And so that's why, you know, and, and plus, you know, as we're, we're really more Euro gamers and less, you know, hack and slash, Ameritrash dice chuckers, so this is fantasy that's really up our angle, uh, up our alley. That's the gnomes of Zavendor. Alrighty, now I think that's number five. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Number five, okay. This is actually the second game from designer, what's his name, um, Alf uh, uh, Siegert. Alf Siegert, Fantastica. This is a lovely, wonderful, whimsical game that, again, yes, is still fantasy. It's got trolls, and it's got witches, and it's got warlocks in it, so it's fantasy. Although, actually, uh, you know, most of the fan, I mean, all the fantasy. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, gorgeous, eye-catching game because all the art for it is public domain existing art that you could go and see in a museum, and it's all here in this game. Very, very smart, very, very clever of ALF to pursue that route because that means you didn't have to pay, you know, through the nose to, you know, to a bunch of artists. And, you know, and the cards themselves, let's get some out here, are gorgeous. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, there are artist people who could actually you know, identify all these classic pieces of art. I certainly couldn't, but it's just a wonderful game. And now, interestingly, this is a deck builder as well. Um, although it is a competitive one, and it's it's actually one of the one of the few deck builders that fuses you know deck building, you know, getting cards, making your deck strong, and all that with a board mechanism. Basically, what happens is you've got this big board that um, on each of these intersections. Cards appear, and these are monsters and other things that you could collect. And you have a a uh, a, a, a you know a token that represents you that you can move around from space to space. So basically, if you want to move from here to here, and there's a witch in the way, you have to defeat the witch. And but if in your deck of cards that you draw every turn, because it's a deck builder, if you have a, a witch, I think needs water to defeat it. Of course, because that's what witches need to be defeat them. You can use the water to j jump over here, defeat the witch, and then add the witch to your deck. And in this way, as you move around and you know, defeat creatures and explore stuff, and, and there's other things that appear in these, you know, like these big, gigantic wooden things that are shops and different, and towers and all kinds of stuff. As you travel around this board using very simple deck um, you know, building mechanisms, you get more and more powerful, and you're trying to complete class. You're trying to go to specific places on the board with specific cards that you can play that will let you complete quests and score points. It's a really simple game. I think this is another really great gateway game, but Jen and I enjoy it very much. It comes with a lot of variety, so you can play a long game, you can play a short game. Also, never done it, but uh, this, uh, this supports uh, two and three is a competitive game, but four players is a team game. So it's actually um, you know two versus two. I would love to do that someday, because you know it's just a really, really cool idea, working cooperatively as a team to try to conquer Fantastica. Wonderful game, very simple, very smooth, very fun to play, and um, just, again, full of whimsy and charm. Absolutely love it. Okay, so that was number five. Now, number four. Okay, now we're getting back into the more meat and potatoes type of fantasy, claustrophobia. This is a straight up, very cool dungeon romp. And you know, with, you know, with tile-based dungeons, and you, as you explore, you lay down new tiles, and you find more and more uh, space. These tiles are gigantic, I should say, right now. So right off the bat, as a fair warning, this game, if you want to play it, it needs a lot of table space. Because look, these tiles are almost as big as my face, and I have a very big face. So you know, they, they take up a lot of space as the dungeon starts to expand, and you find more and more dark corners. But it's beautiful when it's laid out. If you've got the table space, oh, it's so gorgeous. And another nice thing, a rare rarity, this game comes with all its minis pre-painted. Look at this guy. Come on, focus. Oh, look at him. And actually, a, a fairly nice job. Obviously, nowhere near as cool as you know, professionally super done. But still, I'm pretty pleased. This is actually uh, one of the Lady Warriors from Profundus, the expansion. But anyway, so it's all very cool just in terms of its production value and its, you know, its table impact when you're playing it. 
But that's not what puts it on the list. There's lots of games that are like that. What puts this on the list is it's really brilliant asymmetrical play. One player is the dungeon master, the other player is controlling a series of heroes, and the game comes with a manual full of adventures. You know, with different setups. Sometimes the map is pre-made. Sometimes it's explored piece by piece. Um, you know, the player has. You know, the, the dungeon master has different um, boss monsters he can bring out. So that's all very cool. Now that's not that unique either. Here's what makes the game really unique. How both the heroes and the, uh, the Dungeon Masters play. Basically, this is one of the hero uh, did I put it right? Yeah. One, one of the hero cards you get, you know, the player might be using the Redeemer, who's basically a cleric type guy. Or is he? No, or is that one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a cleric. I see. And then there's lots of different ones. There's, you know, thiefy type guys and big burly strong guys. Now there's little thief girls and whatnot. But this is like the cleric type guy. Now what happens is on the player's turn, let's see, they roll a bunch of dice. And um, you know, the, the player rolls dice because the player has multiple characters, the when you call the hero. And you have to choose for each of these characters which die you put in these slots. And these die will you know, dramatically change whether the character is particularly strong or particularly weak that turn. If, you know, if he's going to be strong on offense, if he's going to be able to move really far. And so every turn for the hero players, it's a, it's a really interesting puzzle to figure out, okay, these are the dice I've got. How do I deploy them amongst my forces to be able to do whatever I need to do? Maybe I need to beat feet halfway across the dungeon really quick. And so I'll give the, the, you know, the really good dice to my thief so you can run really fast. But then i got to give the crap die to my warrior who's left behind fighting you know, five demon dogs and whatnot. And so that's really cool. But then it's equally cool to be the dungeon master because the dungeon master, when he rolls his dice, he basically, um, you know, it, this is kind of a Kingsburg, Alien Frontiers kind of thing where, you know, you can put different combinations of dice in these different spaces. Uh, you know, you have to, you know, uh, one die with at least a uh, score of five or more. Any die can go in here. Um, one odd die and one even die if you want to activate this. So when you roll, you have to figure out how am I going to spend these dice on my big board. You know, some of these things just like earn you more mana that you can save up and use later for a big attack. Some of them let you move stuff around. Some of them let you change. I mean, there's so many cool things you can do here. But well, actually, my favorite thing is doing the uh, the calm before the storm, which any die can go in here, and basically um, it lets you roll an extra die during the next level. So it's like, okay, this level I'm not going to hit you, but when um, the hero sees I put something there, they know next turn they're going to get hit hard. So it's a wonderful game. Very fun, very clever, and very different. Does not play like any of its contemporaries. Really stands out from the crowd. And then again, on top of that, it's gorgeous. It is absolutely gobsmacking gorgeous. That's claustrophobia. That was number four. Number three, a very, very popular game. Lords of Waterdeep. This is a straight up worker placement game. You know, the simplest way you can put it, this is a simplified Kalis. Um, in that, you know, you're placing workers on the board, building more buildings to give, um, you know, special abilities, using the buildings that are already on there. All in the interest, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty board when you, when you put a lot, it's not the prettiest in the world, but it looks really nice. I mean, I don't know, maybe some people would say it's sterile, but the thing is, it is so much fun to play. It's a, it's a by the numbers, very simple, very straightforward worker placement game. You've got a certain number of agents, you send them out to the different buildings, which are over time accumulating um, resources. And in this game, resources are thieves, warriors, clerics, and wizards, although they are still represented by cubes. But the game feels much more thematic if you don't say, oh, I want to take three black cubes. Say you want to take three rogues. It makes the game a lot more fun. I always do that. I mean, a lot of people say, ah, it's, it's not thematic at all. That's because you're choosing for it not to be thematic. That's like saying Agricola isn't thematic because the sheep are little cubes. It's thematic. This is thematic. You just, you're, you're picking up rogues. You're not picking up black cubes. Anyway, so you're picking up all these um, warriors, thieves, clerics, and wizards because quests are coming out on cards. And you know, there's basically kind of a simple card draft where you know, people are trying to grab these cards that, have, that have the right requirements for the right number of resources that match what they have collected. And on top of that, they've got secret objectives that they need to pursue that will give them bonus points at the end of the game. Um, but you know, if, if an opponent is savvy, you can figure out that, oh, that guy's really in the lead and it's clear that he wants these kinds of quests. Everybody, we need to start. But anyway, that's more of a four-player game. When you're playing two-player, it's, it's very straightforward, it's very fast, very smooth, super sweet, super simple. This is probably one of the ultimate games. This is the gateway game. If you're trying to convince somebody who is at all interested in fantasy, if you have friends who love video games and love fantasy and love Lord of the Rings, but think board games are stupid, get this game. This will convince them that board games are something special. Uh, it's almost an ironclad guarantee. And you know, it's so good. It's so smooth. There's an expansion come for it. Actually, I should say, I've done a run-through for this too, so you can watch my run-through video if you want to know more. But anyway, that was number three, Lords of Waterdeep. Oh, we're getting close to the end. Number two, 
Oh, and believe me, number two and number one was a very, very tough choice. But at the end of the day, number two went to Legends of Andor, which is a brand new game, just came out last year, from Michael Menzel, who previous to this game had been pretty widely known as the best artist working in board games, or certainly maybe one of the most popular. His art in any game is elevates the quality of the game. His boards are so beautiful that even if you think the game's only so-so, you're still inclined to play it just because it's so beautiful. And so his, his art is so atmospheric, it really captures the feeling of the place and makes you feel like you're there. And that's certainly true for Legends of Andor too. His first, his first ever design, uh, he's made one of his most beautiful boards ever, and he's also made an incredibly innovative and brilliant design for what is at its heart a very straightforward fantasy adventure game starring four heroes, you know, a warrior, a dwarf, an uh, archer, and a wizard. Couldn't be more standard, couldn't be more bog standard meat and potatoes stuff. But what makes this game so special in terms of gameplay, it's just, I want to take, there's a lot of pieces, I don't want to take them all out and spread all the pieces. You know, the board is beautiful, you're, you know, you're, you're searching all over the place, trying to do little quests that come up all over the place, and there are monsters that are constantly, every turn, inexorably moving forward, closer and closer to the castle. Everybody wins if you complete whatever quest is, and the game actually comes with several different scenarios you can play, including one of which, which has a huge amount of replayability. A lot of people say, yeah, Endor's great, but once you've finished all the scenarios, it'll be boring and you'll throw it away. That's not not true at all. Scenario number three is designed to have as much variety of gameplay as Pandemic. So, I mean, that, that's our personal opinion. We can play Larry number three because it throws in randomly generated quests, randomly generated monsters, randomly generated, you know, everything. So that every time you play three, it's going to be a different, randomly uh, chosen end boss fights. And on top of that, there are all the other uh, missions. And new missions have come out since then. And there's an expansion coming out. Oh, please, Fantasy Flight, please print it in English. This is so important. Also, this, uh, I should say, did it win? Did this win for Kennerspiel this year? Yes, it did. This won the Kennerspiel this year for 2012, uh, marking it in Germany's eye as the best light to medium board game of the year. And it really deserves it. This game is so rock solid. Oh, I didn't say what's innovative. I mean, well, I mean, uh, I would have to, well, first of all, I've done a run through for this. So you can certainly find out if you, if you watch the run through. But what's really, really cool about this game more than anything else, and I'll be uh, uh, fair warning, a lot of people hate the game for this. They think this is actually anti-thematic, but I, I, I think they're just being short-sighted. I mean, I think the game is very, very thematic. The, the tricky thing is, you have your goals you have to do, you have to run around, you, you level up, you fight, you buy stuff at the shop, all the standard stuff. You know, the mechanisms are very, very simple. Here's the trick. Every time you kill a monster, let's see, where is it? Oh, you can kind of see it over here. The timer for the game gets shorter and shorter. So the problem is, yes, you could go out there and wipe out the, wipe the floor with all the monsters and just level up and fight the tougher monsters and have no problems at all. Just, you know, clean the clock. And if you were to do that, this game would play pretty much like Descent or just about any other fantasy board game out there. But it's this timer that makes it so that every time you kill a monster, you're killing your own chances of survival, which suddenly turns this from a, you know, a, uh, meat and potatoes hack and slash into a very complex Euro puzzle to solve. Because what you have to be do, you have to be very, very smart about which monsters you let live and which monsters you kill, which are the true threats. Because, um, you know, I mean, first of all, if too many monsters come on the board, you can have these really bad chain reaction things that can cause you to lose in a heartbeat, much like, you know, the epidemic outbreaks in, in um, pandemic. So you, you have to be very surgical about, and choose which, cre which um, creatures to hit. Because you can't hit all of them, so you have to be smart about which ones you hit. And then the really, really tough one, oh, it's it's just great. And you know, it's so thematic. It has really, really strong storytelling. Some of the strongest storytelling of any board game ever. Also, it has a very, very innovative way of teaching how to play the game. It doesn't come with a manual. It just comes with a couple of quick cards. It's, it reads these cards, tells you how to set up the game, and then you start playing. But you put these other cards, and when you reach certain spots, you reveal them and you read. So it plays very much like a video game tutorial. Some people like it, some people hate it. I thought it was very, very clever. A really great way that ensures that, and that's probably one of the reasons it won the Kenner Spiel. Anybody can play this game, and if you're looking for something that will will scratch all your itch of rolling dice and um, you know and trying to get criticals and, and take out bad guys, but you want something that really taxes your brain, really makes you stop and think, and really makes you have to puzzle something out, Legends of Andor is your game, and that's why it's our number two. Which leads us to the number one game, which I've already done a run through for. I did it a while ago. I strongly recommend you look at it, but. Dungeon Pets. Oh my god, this game is so awesome. Just look at this cover. Just look at it. It is so full of fantasy whimsy and fun. This game just makes you laugh. This game makes you cry. This game takes you on an emotional roller coaster. What it is, basically, 
players are a family of little, what are they, I forget if they're gnome, or imps, I think. They're these little imps. You know, Jen's always the purple ones, I'm always the green ones. Or, yeah, are they purple? No, she's kind of the bluish purpley ones. Anyway, so you have this family of imps. And what we do, what this family does is, um, we raise dungeon pets. We basically, from babies, from you know, the moment they, they crack out of their shells, we raise these little creatures and grow them up and feed them and um, clean them and uh, play with them and entertain them, all to make sure that they grow up to strong, healthy, hardy monsters that will be bought by all the, the local dungeon lords who will come once every turn at the end of a turn, and try and you know with, with specific things. There might be a dungeon lord who like there's a granny dungeon lord who wants a really sweet or you know a, a cute and cuddly but sickly creature. One that's actually you've been kind of mistreated and has actually gotten sick. She wants that because she wants to take care of it. Um, or you know like the really you know badass dungeon lord who wants a really tough killer monster, and so you've had to raise this monster to be angry and vicious. And um, so you know it's it's very thematic, very fun. You know it's. It's a worker placement game, uh, you know, and then the worker placement mechanics are really, really solid. But the other thing that makes this game so cool, see if I can find them. Where are the creatures? Yes, is the creatures, the, the dungeon pets themselves. There's a whole bunch of them. Just grab one at random. Um, oh, oh. Uh, this is Uni, the unicorn. Well, as you can see, he's closer to kind of like a rhinoceros, but he's a unicorn. I mean, he's got that little daisy. See, here's the thing. Uh, he's a unicorn. He's a vegetarian. Which means he doesn't eat meat, so you have to pay attention to that. You have to buy, you can't buy him meat at the market, you have to buy vegetables for him. And what happens is he starts off as a little baby. Uh, there we go. Yeah, as a little baby that just needs this guy every turn. Um, green means he needs some food, and in his case, he needs vegetables. And purple means he's a magical creature, and so he needs to have a release for his, his magical, because if, if not, he, um, you know, his, the magic in him gets pent up and it, he might erupt in tentacles, and, we were, and then that you know, reduces his sale value. But then, as he gets older, he needs more food. And then, he needs somebody to play with him, because now he wants to play, he's getting into his adolescence. And then, oh, now the magic's really starting. You really need to have some magical absorption stuff in his cage. And now he wants even more play. And you know, and the longer you, the older he gets, the longer he stays in your care, the more tricky it is to you know apply your workers to give him everything he needs, um, while still doing everything else you need to do. You know, um, in entering him in in, um, in creature beauty contests and selling him and going to the market and buying stuff and and you know and taking care of your business. And so there's a lot of stuff going on. But the core of it, every turn. Here's the other thing that's brilliant about this game. You know, when he's, say, he's fairly young, right? What's going to he's, he's three years old or three months old or whatever. Once, uh, when he's at this age, he's going to draw three cards. Two green cards, food cards, and a magic card. And you will already have some cards in your hand. And the cards mean that he will do different things. Like, so, you know, if he drew that green card, that green card he drew might make him poop. And you have to clean up. Might make him sick. Oh, the poor little fella. Or poop. Or, or eat, might make him hungry. So the thing is, based on the cards you get that you draw when he's three years old, and, and bear in mind, you'll often have like two, maybe even three creatures that are doing this. You're having to balance all their needs all at once. You never know exactly what he's gonna need to make him happy. Um, you can do, there are some things that let you do some hand management. So um, you know, like there's um, books of how to raise your pets that'll let you have extra cards in your hand. So you have a little bit more control over the draw. Um, you know, but still, you know, and, and you can get a special cage that has a lawn in it that will automatically feed him so you don't have to go get food. There's all these great things. But the thing is, if you um, fail, if you fail to meet all his needs in his third year of life, he then Oh, I'm not going to pull it out. But these gray cubes right here, they're tr gray translucent cubes, are cubes of sorrow. And it means he's sad. And it is heartbreaking to put cubes of sorrow on these guys because they're so cute and they are in your care. You start to care for these like you're really raising a creature that is unpredictable. This game is so brilliant, so thematic. Jen and I love it to death. This is actually not only our top fantasy game, this is our second, well, it's my second top game. I'd have to talk with Jen. I know it's in her top five easily. It might be her favorite game of all time, but certainly in probably her top three. It's my number two. This game is amazing. I cannot recommend highly enough Dungeon Pets, which is our number one fantasy game. Uh, and there you go. That was it. Rotto has run through our top 10 fantasy board games. And if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, please let me know. I'd love to hear what you guys think about this. If you have any suggestions about how I should continue to do top 10 lists. But uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully it's uh, been useful. 
like I said, I've done run-throughs for several of these already. You can check those out. And um, otherwise, and, you know, and my apologies to all of the other great fantasy games we have that didn't make the top 10. But hey, you know what? It's a top 10. That's what people ask for. So um, maybe you'll see some of the other ones if I ever do um, you know, some other lists, you know, like a top 50 games period or stuff like that. Anyway, though, I'm going to end it right there. That was it. Top 10 fantasy. Thanks for watching, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you later. Have a good day. Bye-bye.